Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine anim enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a wall. And now shall mine head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, ye, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy ways, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breath out cruelty. I have fainted unless I have believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Yeah, that psalm was too good. I couldn't just refer to a few verses and carry on from it. So this morning in the wee hours, I decided to preach my message on Psalm 27 here. We'll get right into it in verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The question's asked, who can you fear? Who should you fear? Who shall you fear? List them now. <laughs> list them. Make a list. Come on. Anybody? Should you fear nothing, right? There's nothing. There's no one to fear. What about our enemies, though? What about the wicked? The Bible continues on in verse 2, and I would say also when the Bible says, whom shall you fear, we can also look at what should we fear and where should we fear. We ought not fear anything or anywhere, but here, perhaps the wicked could be one of them, but verse 2 sets that at ease when it says, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. When they came, they stumbled. When they attacked, they fell. When they approached and tried to malign and destroy, they were consumed with their own attacks and their own revenge fell upon them. The devourer was destroyed as a result of God stepping in. Who should you be afraid of when the Lord is your light and the Lord is your salvation and the Lord is the strength of your life? Nobody. Not the wicked, not your foes, not your enemies. Nobody. Nothing can stand between you and God and God's will for your life if you will only trust Him. Verse 3, it says, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. That's a promise that David here is making to himself. My heart should not fear. And I think he decided this before the battle even came. We ought to decide some of these truths before the battle comes. When the enemy's against us, I will not fear. My heart will not fear. Decide that today in a good time when nobody's attacking you. So that way you don't have to make the decision when the time comes when you have a host encamping against you. You simply react and respond according to the things that you've already promised yourself and decided upon. Though an host should encamp, I will not fear. Fear is what David is saying to himself. Promise yourself this day. The war should rise up against me. In this will I be confident. What, in my own strength? No, in God who is my strength, who is my salvation, who is the light of my life. Many will rise against you one day. You will face a multitude if you're standing in God's stead, 
on this world. If you're standing in the place of the Lord God Almighty, if you're with him, you will be against the world and eventually the world will find itself against you. So promise yourself today, my heart shall not fear. Establish yourself in the confidence of the Lord, in Christ your Savior. Put your flag down and decide, I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to lean on him. He's going to be the light to guide my days. He's going to be the salvation that I trust in, not only for my eternal soul, but also for my temporal life today. He is going to be the strength that helps me get through and sustains me every day. You've got to decide these things today. God promises them. Do you know what you do? You just accept them. That's true for me, God. I believe you're my light. I believe you're my salvation. I believe you are the strength of my life. Stand with me, God. I'm confident in this. I will not fear them because you are my confidence and you are my high tower. Remind yourself of these truths and they will carry you through daily. Psalm 141, if you would. Keep your finger there in Psalm 27. Psalm 141. I'm reminded of that hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. We need to look to Christ. In Psalm 104, in verse 8, it says, But mine eyes are unto Thee, O God the Lord. In Thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst that I withal escape. Take that prayer and pray it often. Pray it daily. Think about those words even as we read them. With your eyes upon God, you can trust in Him and ask Him, don't leave me destitute and He never will. Keep me from the snares. Keep me from the gins which the workers of iniquity have laid. Keep me from the traps which the world would have me swallowed up in. Let the wicked fall into their own traps and their own snares. And God will work these things out for you in due time. I promise you, you will not be ensnared and trapped in anything that the workers of iniquity have let for you if you're just leaning on God. And you will with all escape, according to this promise here, given to David. Back in Psalm 27 and in verse 4, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look what verse 4 says of David. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Here's another moment where David is dedicating himself afresh to God. I've desired of the Lord this, and I'm going to seek after this. And what is it? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his holy temple. Here David desires a face-to-face -face encounter with God Almighty. He wants to see him, seeking after him that what? He would dwell in his house, literally abiding with God, beholding the beauty of the Lord in his holiness. This is what David wants more than anything. I want to inquire at his temple. I want to step into his house. I want to be in the presence of God. Every single day, all the days of my life is what here David desires. He desires for face to face in the house of God to see his beauty and to inquire at his holy temple. And this here is just the shadow of things to come. Look, David had to literally get up and go and enter in to the temple. He had to get up and go and walk into the house of the Lord. And there he found the presence of God. And there he found the beauty of the Lord. And there he could bask in his presence all the days of his life. But it took some effort on his behalf. He had to get up and go. But a shadow of what's to come is this. And you can go to Ephesians chapter 2. Keep your finger in Psalm 27 and go to Ephesians chapter 2. After John, after Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, a little book, and then Ephesians. Ephesians, there's four little wee letters there in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 2. 
Look, David wants to meet with God face to face. And I today want to meet with God face to face. As Moses was able in the book of Numbers to speak with, Mo- with, with God, as Moses spoke to God face to face, as a man doth a friend, as Abraham was known as the friend of God, as prophets of old have constantly had these face to face experiences where many of them fell to their ground as dead. I want to have this moment with God. I want to know him face to face. Here we see in Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read quickly in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That was you. You were of the children of disobedience. You were dead in trespasses and sins. But here in verse 2 he says, wherein in time past ye walked. That's a past tense statement. He's saying you walked according to the devil. You walked according to the spirit of this world. But now you are quickened. Something has changed. Verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. In what? In the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So by nature. It was a natural state that we were in where we were the children of wrath. Wrath was destined to be upon us because we were not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at this in verse 4. But God, and I love those two words when they're together. But God, we're going to see that man was dead. Man was trapped. Man was following the prince of this air, stuck in disobedience. Man was dead, but God. But God stepped in and who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. God commendeth, proved his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, showing his mercy, showing his great love here. Verse 5, it says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Look, God saving you has nothing to do with you. And we see there in verse 7, he's making it plain. The main reason that he saved you is to show himself strong, to bring himself glory. In ages to come, he wants all to see the riches of his grace and his kindness. And that's why he made us alive. That's why he quickened us from the dead. Bottom line, the whole purpose of God saving you and showing his workmanship, like verse 10 says, was so that he would get glorified. We're nothing special, but simply a vessel that God chose to redeem. Yeah, our part was to believe him, but he died for all of us, providing the way. We simply had to yield to that and accept the gift that he had given us. Glory to God. Verse 13. But now, here's another one. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So you were apart from what he's talking about. You were away from what verse 12 calls the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, the nation of Israel. His chosen people, what he's talking about here. You were afar off from that, but now, thanks to what? The blood of Christ, you are nigh unto this promise and nigh unto this nation how is that possible verse 14 for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man and so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Enmity is an enemy. That, that, is, that is hostility. You're separated because you're an enemy from God and an enemy from the commonwealth of Israel until you received of the promise. And what was the promise? That he has great love for you. Receive it. That he shed his blood for you. Receive that. That he died on a cross for you. Simply receive that. And in doing so, you become reconciled unto him at that time. Now look at verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which are far off and to them which were nigh. Verse verse 18. For through him we both have access 
by one spirit unto the Father. Now remember David talking about how he wanted to go unto the house of God, that he wanted to be in the tabernacle of God, that he wanted to be in the presence of God. Here's your access. Even as David had to get up and go and enter into God's house, here we have access by one spirit unto the Father, into that same abode, into that same place where God is. Access, but not only so, look at this, verse 19. Not only do we have access that we can come and go as we please, as it seems, we can enter into the presence of God, and, and that is our, we have a ticket to go in, essentially, but it gets better than this. Verse 19 says, Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners... So we're not just passing through God's nation. We're not just coming for a moment and then leaving again. No, we are, look, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, belonging to the household of God. We've entered into and are of the household of God. Notice it doesn't say, and in the household of God, but literally of it. We're a part of God's house here at this time. And this illustration starts to play out really interestingly because again David had to go into the household of God to meet with God and to see him face to face he had to go into and that's what he asked for can I go into I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and here God says that we are through faith in Christ the grace that saved us through that faith, that gift of God that we receive that is not of works, but simply based upon his own merit, shed blood and the cross, we are now of that same household that David desired to be in. Verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I believe this is revealing that not only are we of the household and we are with the saints and fellow citizens, but we are literally a part of that building. Christ being the chief cornerstone, and we are built upon that foundation of Christ first, the apostles and prophets secondarily, and we are there upon it. And that's what is our foundation here as Bible-believing Christians, looking to the book of Ephesians as giving us validation for that. Look at verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We're part of this structure. The building is fitly framed together. Groweth unto a temple in the Lord, in whom also we are builded for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The habitation of God through the Spirit is what we are as part of the temple here of God. It's an interesting, interesting back and forth. We desire as David, yes, to enter into God's temple and to abide with him and see him face to face. But here we see God actually making a way through the death of his son and his shed blood that we can become the house in which he would enter in. It's that reciprocal relationship. Christ will say it and I'll bring it up again later. I in thee and thee in me. He wants to dwell in us as a temple as we dwell in him as a temple. Interesting spiritual truths. And something that David could only have faith about and believe upon and think about. Turn to the right and go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Many of us know Hebrews chapter 11 as the faith book. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. There's your definition for faith there in three verses in a nutshell. And then we see faith acted out in these saints' lives. By faith Abel, by faith Enoch. By faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith also Sarah. These died in faith, it continues in. By faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph, by faith Moses, by faith he forsook Egypt, he kept the Passover, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith the walls of Jericho fell, by faith 
the harlot Rahab, and he continues on and on and on and talks about who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lying, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword and wandered about in sheepskins and goatkins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Look at verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All These all, having obtained a good report through faith, look at this, receive not the promise. These had great works and exploits in the faith of God. They were believers, but they looked to a promise that they never received. And that's actually how they activated their faith. Now we look back to a promise that we have received, Jesus Christ and Him crucified on the cross, which emboldens us to be the temple that He would abide in and gives us access to enter into the temple that he has provided for us by faith the same means the same key unlocks these doors by faith look at verse 40 it says god having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect now as david gave an example of he had a good report through the faith that he showed but he had to receive the promise eventually and only through us. Remember back in Psalm 27, David entered into the temple. He went to inquire, back in Psalm 27, of the Lord. He went to seek the Lord. He went to be with the Lord. David desired to be in his house. He desired to be in God's house presence and yet he never received of that promise fully but had to enter into a brick and mortar building back in psalm chapter 27 in verse 5 it says for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me and he shall set me upon a rock we can look how this was fulfilled partially here. Look to the fulfillment in what we just have read. We saw back there that God provided himself as that chief foundation, that chief cornerstone, in which the law and the prophets and the apostles were all built and fitly framed upon. That same foundation that we were built upon by faith, and here he says, he shall set me upon a rock. David here, accepting that that truth is afar off for him through faith, he needed to look forward to the time when he would be put upon that rock, when he would be framed upon that rock. And here we are, set upon that rock ourselves. We need to trust by faith what has happened on that cross, even as David looks forward to what would happen one day upon the cross. We can continue on and... Verse 6, and we find reasons to sing here. It said, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. What a joyful opportunity it is for us to enter into the house of God and sing praises unto him. You know he inhabits that. You want to see God face to face? Start celebrating. Start singing joyfully unto him. God inhabits the praises of Israel. And spiritually speaking, according to Ephesians 2, we are now part of that commonwealth. So bring God into your presence by singing praise unto him. And he will inhabit that praise. We need to be confident in a few things. Firstly, be confident he in prayer. Be confident in obedience. Be confident in dependence. And be confident even when you're alone. Look at verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. Now the truth is we've entered into God's temple. We are God's temple. and We have that reciprocating abiding. Now we have access. Even David wanted to go and inquire at God. You can inquire at the Lord anytime. 
Now, I tell Caleb oftentimes that we can speak to Jesus anytime. He's everywhere. He's all places, but one place that he really likes to meet with God's people is in church, in the assembly, in the congregation. He promises that where two or more are gathered in his name, there am I in the midst. And so look to that. But when you do, look to that with confidence here in prayer. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. You can be confident that indeed he will answer your prayers. Verse 9, or verse 8, it says, When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And I love this because this is confidence in obedience. We can be confident when God commands you something. He's not trying to trip you up. He's not trying to mess you up. He's not trying to trick you. And so you should just obey. As God gives the command, just obey. Look what David does here. God said, seek ye my face. The response of your heart should be, thy face, Lord, will I seek. God says, read your Bible. Thy Bible, O Lord, will I read. God says, Love your family. Love your wife if you're married. Love your husband the same. I will, Lord. That needs to be our response to every command that God gives us. Be confident in your obedience unto Him. You think God's trying to give you some command that's not good for you? Every command of the Lord is right, true, perfect, just. Every statute of the Lord is clean. And so when he says, thus shalt thou, our response should be, I will, Lord, with confidence, with faith. Verse 9, it says, hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Look at this. This is a statement of great dependence. And we can be confident even when we're dependent. You don't want to be dependent on man. The arm of flesh will definitely fail you. But you can trust the Lord. And here, David goes through this time where he seems to be doubting. But what he's doing is he's really just reflecting his dependence on the Lord. Hide not thy face from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. In other words, Lord, don't turn from me. You've been my help, he says. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. He's admitting that his salvation is purely hinged on God, whether it's his eternal soul, which is settled and established at this point, but it's also just the one that will save him from the next challenge and save him from the next bout of strife, save him from the next problem in his life. God, don't forsake me. I'm depending on you. David displays his neediness before us. We think of David as a great warrior, and many people in this room are, are strong individuals. But don't be afraid to show a little bit of dependence on God. And God, just say, God, don't, don't leave me. I need you. And, and, and show him your neediness. Watch him do great exploits in your life as a result. God wants us to be needy. Just like we all, we all like when a young child, whether it's a nephew or a niece or a, our son or a daughter, when they express that they really need you. I need your help. Dads love that. Moms love that when their children need them. God loves it when his children need him. And display their weakness and display their frailty and their desire to have him not leave them alone. But look at this. Verse 10 says, Sometimes we will stand alone according to this world. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. And you think of a little child. I mean, nothing is more important to a little child than mommy and daddy their mother and their father if we're outside and we're playing after church and it's getting dark if i even turn the corner without caleb seeing me he gets very upset and distraught where did daddy go right he needs me he needs to see me there so to an earthly person nothing is more needful than mommy and daddy mother and father forsake me when those forsake you when what you need most, when what's most important to you, when what you desire most, when your rock in this world, as a child would be, father and mother, mommy and daddy, when that's gone, then the Lord will take me up. Literally, God's there to protect and to keep. And we promise Caleb that all the time. Even if, We will never leave you. We will never forsake you. We'll do our best for you, but Jesus is always here. And when you're scared and worried, you're, you're alone, Jesus is always there for you to take you up and to care for you. Be confident even when you're seemingly alone, when you're feeling lonely. 
And as a Christian, you're going to have to make stands in your life where you'll seem to be alone. Even in a marriage, sometimes you're going to have to make stands which make you seem like you're alone. Husbands leading their wives have to make stands and, and, and stand alone and be willing to stand alone against some decisions that are being made. Parents against children. There's stands that need to be made. As we go out into the world, we're going to have to make stands sometimes and seemingly be standing alone. But if you're in the will of God, you're never alone. In those moments when you seem to be alone, feel like you're alone, God is there to take you up. That's a nice illustration too, like a, like a child. I can even think of picking up Caleb right now. When you pick him up, right? When you take him up. That's how God will just pick us up. Like it's nothing, right? It's easy. He picks you up. He cares for you. He carries you. So we can be confident. We have reason to sing. We can be confident in prayer. We can be confident in obedience. We can be confident in our dependence on God. And we can be confident even when we seem to be alone in all of these things. God has never left anybody. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Look at verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Across the page in Psalm 25 and in verse 4, it says, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. And this is what we need. We need God to show us the way. We need to teach us the paths that we ought to go to. We need to be led in his truth. And if we're not being shown the next path, or if we're not being directed in the next way, if he's not revealing to us the next truth, wait all the day. Don't get ahead of God. God sometimes just has us in this season of waiting, of pause, of reflecting, of learning and to retain what we've already known and learned and, and what we're trusting Him in today. Sometimes we get ahead of ourselves, don't we? And eventually, we, if we get too far ahead of God, then, then the path isn't clear. The way isn't illuminated. There is no truth before us. But God here says, hey, wait on me. And this is what David is promising to the Lord. God, if you'll show me the way, if you'll show me the path, then I'll wait until you do. I'll pause until I do. And that's an important part of the Christian life is that patience and that long-suffering. Psalm 86. Psalm 86. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. In Psalm chapter 86, in verse 11, again it says, Teach me thy way. You think there's any room for a spirit that isn't teachable in the Christian life? We need to be able to be taught. Even as a young child needs to be taught everything as they grow up. We need to be taught in the way of truth. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. That's what we need more of in our lives is, God, I'm not moving until you show me the way. God, I desire in promising ourselves, I will walk in thy truth. And look at this. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Look, our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know it? And our hearts can go in all different directions. But if we promise ourselves and if we ask God to unite our hearts with his truth and put our hearts towards fearing him above all things, then we will be much better off and in the right direction for following after God and for doing right in this life. Verse 12, it says, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And how is that even possible unless you've united your heart in his fear? Praising him with all your heart. That's, a, that's a, too high of a thing to achieve of my own flesh, I'll tell you what. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. Look at verse 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. And when you think about where you came from, you might be able to confess something like this as David. I've been delivered from the lowest hell. And maybe you didn't live in the lowest of hell in this life, but that's where you were destined to before you came to Christ. Look to his great mercy that he has for us. Verse 14 says, O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy 
and truth. And that is true of our God. He can teach you in the way that you ought to go. And why would you have it any other way when verse 15 talks about him and his character being far surpassing anyone else you can follow in this life? No matter who you can think of that you've followed after, been mentored by, whether it's even your own parents, they've fallen short of this. Our Lord that is full of compassion, that is gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and in truth. Fall after him and you'll never be led astray. Go back to Psalm 27. Before you do, we'll make a quick pit stop in Psalm 23. Following after God, you'll never be led astray and you can be confident. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23. Look at this. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Look where he's leading us, okay? So he makes you to lay down, find rest, find solace in these wonderful green pastures. If you can think about that in the summertime when the sun is shining down and you find a nice spot of grass to get comfortable in. It says, he leadeth me beside still waters. And look at this, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Because of who he is, he leads us and directs us and guides us into these comfortable, calming scenarios in these places. These restoring places. My soul is, is, is brought to a place of restoration and refreshment. But look at this. What is going on in my soul at that time, what is going on in my spirit at that time as I'm being led by my shepherd it's far different than what the actual surroundings are. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So here, God is saying that He's giving us a place of green pastures and giving us a presence that is like still waters. He's restoring us constantly and consistently even though we're in the valley of the shadow of death. That's what we need. See, that's the difference between David's faith and our faith having received the promise. David, of course, wrote this psalm and he looked forward to the time when he, and he, he certainly experienced those times when things were bad, things were of death, things were dark and dismal, and yet he was being restored moment by moment by God. But here we have this opportunity as well in our position, abiding in the presence of of God and having him lead us and restore us and keep us even though we're going through something that seems it would be certain death were it not for the presence of God there. And the best thing is, is we don't have to enter into some temple. We don't have to enter into the house of God. We are the house of God. We are built as that foundation that God desires to dwell in. His Holy Spirit entered into us when we believed on him by faith and now we have access to Him just as much as He desires and has access to us. God promises in verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. He's saying, I have provision for you. I have anointing upon your head and strength and goodness that runneth over available for you. I will restore you even though you're going through certain death. You can have comfort. You can have confidence with me. Verse 6, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And he says it here again. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will dwell as the house of the Lord forever here as Bible-believing Christians. And that's a wonderful gift that David did not experience. But we can look to what David experienced from the outside looking in, knowing that we have received of that promise and provided some better thing for him as a result. This is fulfilled in you, certainly. Go to John chapter 15. Keep your finger in Psalm 27. John chapter 15. will be the last big turn we'll make. John 15. This promise is fulfilled in you, even as Jesus says. In John 15, he gives the sermon here. He says, I am the true vine my father is the husbandman every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit god wants you to bring forth much fruit in this life look at this verse three now ye are clean through the word which i have spoken 
unto you. And that's the same word by which ye are born again. Now verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a, man, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. The revelation here is plain that we need to have that reciprocal abiding with Christ. As David was like, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I want to abide in God's presence forever. Even here Jesus is promising, certainly you can, and it's a command. In fact, I'm giving you able, able opportunity because I'm telling you to do it. God doesn't command you something and then not actually enable you, empower you to do it. He's not going to tell you to do something that's impossible. So when God says, abide in me, that's certainly possible. You can do that. And when you do, he says, and I in you. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Back in Psalm 27, David was saying, I want to abide in the house of God all, my, all the days. I want to behold his beauty. I want to inquire at his holy temple. And this is just a picture of what's to come in you. You have God abiding in you. You can abide in God. And when you have that relationship in its fullness... You have access to the Father. He has access to use you. And it's that reciprocal strength that can go forward and do great things in the kingdom of God. Verse 13, it says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Look, the only way we're actually going to feel strong and strengthened is to see His goodness in the land of the living. David here is giving homage to the fact he's believing to see that goodness one day in the land of the living. Today we are alive in Christ. Here we are. See that goodness. It's available to you. We don't need to worry about it. David had fainted without the faith. You have what he looked for. And just remember that. The promise of Hebrews chapter 11 was that David didn't receive the promise that you have. That fulfillment of the promise that you have is what opened the door for him to see the fullness of that promise. The things that he only sung about, only dreamed about, only prophesied of, came to fruition in God's children when he broke down that middle wall of partition. When he died on that cross, shed his precious blood, and allowed us access to the Father. You have that today. The Lord is your light. The Lord is your salvation. The Lord is your strength. Be confident in that fact that the wicked cannot stand in your way and don't fear. We get bogged down by fear when we find a man like David showing extreme amounts of faith. We ought to be able to show just as much and not faint in the times of trouble. David would have fainted if he didn't have faith in what you have. What are you going to do with what you have? Have faith in that to do great exploits. And wait on him. Look at verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Look, you can be confident in Christ. You can be confident in the Lord. At all times. Especially here in prayer. Especially in obedience to him. Especially when you're being dependent upon him. Especially when you seemingly feel all alone. But you need to be led of his spirit. You need to ask him to teach you the way. You need to follow that plain path. Ask that he would not deliver you over to the enemies. The promises are limitless and endless of which God can use and work in your lives. If you simply wait on him, be of good courage, don't fear, have faith, he shall strengthen thine heart. Think of the things we're going through now and just take a psalm like this and apply it to your life. And a host should encamp against you. When was the last time anyone faced a host? A great battalion coming to destroy you and attack you. Well, in the day you do, you'll faint unless you believe 
to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, unless you've already set yourself to be abiding in his holy temple, even as he abides in you, unless you have that relationship steady and established and you're, and you're, and you're doing what God wants you to do here, is what we need more and more, is, is God showing himself strong in believers and believers getting after God. Look at the heart of David. I desired to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He desired to be in God's presence always. He never received that promise in its fullness. But you have that. And there are scores of Psalms where David is just desiring to be with God. And we take advantage of the fact that God's dwelling in us right now. God is with us. We are abiding in Him, He in us. We need to start to take that promise and start to purge it, as God says. Let Him purge it. You know what that means? Cutting off some of the branches that are just sucking up energy and not producing fruit. Cutting off some of the, the weights and sins in our life and purging them so, they, so they're removed and burned up and, and gone away because God wants the best vine to produce the best fruit and He needs believers that trust Him and follow Him and ask after Him and seek after Him in order to do it. David desires something that you have so much. He was a great man of God. You have access. You have opportunity. Just get after him. Pray unto God. Ask after him. Seek him. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Seek, and you shall find. We got a good God. Get to know him. And this is one thing that I've been looking at more and more is, is knowing him and the power of his resurrection. Knowing him. That was the bottom line in which the Apostle Paul said he wanted to know him. All the great things the Apostle Paul had done, all the great works he had done, are nothing. He called, he called the, the, the pre, pre-salvation things but dumb. I've forsaken it all that I may know him. And certainly I have, certainly we have some weight, some things that are, are bogging us down, holding us back from knowing him. We need to get to that point because in these last days, you know who the people that do great exploits are going to be? They that know their God. Let's desire to get, seek after Him. Let's desire to dwell in His house. He desires to dwell in you. He commanded it. Dwell in me. Abide in me and I in you. He wants that. Let's give it to Him so He can give us great opportunities to do wonderful things for Him. And He'll get all the praise and all the glory. Amen?